TikTok series. Um, just for the procedure of the talk, we are going to have uh, the speaker do the presentation presentation first, and then we have the Q and A session at the end of the talk. Um, so for the talk today, we are going to have uh, Sophia Ifantido, who just finished the uh, PhD, and Sophia is going to talk about human center machine learning for mobile sensing data. I hand it over to you, Sophia. Ifan, thank you for the invitation for you and Adrian. So good morning, everyone. I am Sophie Fadidu, and I hold a PhD degree in computer science from the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in Greece. In the next approximately 45 minutes, I will give you an overview of my research regarding human-centered machine learning for mobile sensing data. This project has received funding from the European Union's Horizon 2020 project and under the innovative training network Real-Time Analytics for the Internet of Sports, or RISE for short. Today, we are going to talk about how we can adopt a more human-centered view of machine learning in the domain of mobile, wearable, and ubiquitous computing, or Ubicom for short, encompassing user interaction, data, and algorithmic challenges. Note that each section is color-coded for your convenience so that the presentation is actually easier to follow. So let's start. Today, a large portion of the world population is ubiquitously connecting. But what is ubiquitous computing? Well, according to Mark Weiser, who is considered by many the father of Ubicom, uh, ubiquitous computing can manifest through any device in any location and in any format. Think of your mobile phone or your wearable, for example. Nowadays, one in three US adults uses a wearable device to track their bodies, while two in three believe their phone can actually help them improve their health. These devices have invaded, if I may say, into our everyday lives, often going unnoticed in the background, but generating continuous and extremely large volumes of personal data. This continuous accrual of large volumes of data combined with the powerful capabilities of machine learning has given rise to a wide range of applications, from workplace safety and security to quality control and healthcare monitoring, Particularly with regard, with regard to the latter, mobile and wearable devices nowadays provide a series of previously unheard of machine learning estimates, from recognizing sleep disorders to identifying heart conditions such as atrial fibrillation. It is truly marvelous as these devices are evolving actually into miniature medical instruments right out of our pockets. Yet as with any technological advancement, there is the other side of the coin data coming from mobile and wearable devices are actually not immune to biases. It has been reported that certain sensors integrated in popular consumer devices struggle performing for people with darker skin tones or obesity. And this has real world implications. Research supports that biased pulse oximeter readings might actually have contributed to the observed ethnic dis disparities in COVID-19 mortality outcomes in the US. Such bias technologies are just an example of the so-called alignment problem, where artificial intelligence systems do not take into consideration or align with human values, needs, and expectations. In response to this problem, a research area called human-centered machine learning has emerged, consisting of a set of practices for building, evaluating, deploying, and critiquing machine learning systems that balance technical innovation with human and social concerns. Especially in technologies as close to the human bodies as Ubicom, the focus should not only be shifted to optimizing performance and rapid development, rather we should aim to balance these with social values such as inclusivity and fairness. And while the alignment problem might sound like a singular standalone issue, in reality it incorporates diverse issues across the user interaction data and algorithm feedback loop. But what is this feedback loop? The combination of user data, artificial intelligence, and the interaction with it often creates feedback loops. Feedback loops are essential for designing algorithms that can learn from data, adapt to changing conditions, and improve their performance. For example, a smartwatch might give me a 10K step goal, but I only, let's say, walk 8K steps on average per day. The system can track this interaction and react to it by adapting its recommendation to make it more realistic and personalized to the user at hand. Yet feedback loops incorporate certain challenges. For example, in terms of user interaction, wearable technologies suffer from questionable effectiveness in many contexts. In terms of data, Ubicom works with diverse modalities, but primarily with time series data. 
For example, time step count measurements from your wearable device. And there is a major issue with data access for such sensitive data, leading to limited data resources for Ubicom ML research and business. Finally, in terms of algorithmic challenges, Ubicom frequently adopt, uh, adopts accuracy-centric evaluations, whereby accuracy-centric, we mean uh, any machine learning evaluation that uses conventional machine learning performance metrics, such as accuracy, F1 score, or AUG score, and does not incorporate any human-centered aspect. Taking these challenges into consideration, our goal is actually to align technical innovation in mobile and wearable technologies with human needs, values, and expectations around the feedback loop we discussed before through the following contributions. First, we aim at user interaction alignment through designing and evaluating Ubicom technologies that are evidence-based, theoretically founded, and inclusive. Second, we attempt to tackle data alignment through collecting, ethically publishing, and integrating multimodal Ubicom data. Third, we aim at algorithmic alignment through personalization and the development of open benchmarks for Ubicom use cases. And last, we encourage holistic alignment via investigating and facilitating, facilitating fairness-aware Ubicom technologies. First, we explore the user interaction alignment problem. As we mentioned in the introduction, Ubicom technologies suffer from a number of challenges regarding user interaction. Specifically, wearable devices might claim that they can persuade you to get fitter, for example, but meta-analysis report that in reality, they are only modestly effective in inciting positive behavior change. Additionally, attrition rates or abandonment rates for wearable devices are significantly high. So our first question goes as follows. Which factors affect human-centered mobile and wearable interaction, and how can we quantify them to better align Ubicom technologies with human needs and expectations? To provide an answer to the first question, we first look at existing literature as a baseline. We wanted to learn from past efforts of the community what works and what not in terms of user interaction. So we studied 14 years of Ubicom intervention studies for health behavior change, specifically for physical activity promotion, to explore how popular are such studies, which experimental setups have been utilized, what's the scientific basis behind their designs, which design strategies have proven most effective, and how was the evaluation performed. To systematically analyze such a large corpus of works, we follow Kitchenham's protocol for conducting systematic reviews. As an indication, we started with more than 20,000 studies identified in digital libraries, scanned 16.5K titles and abstracts, and assessed 600 full texts for eligibility. Finally, we included 129 studies in our review. What have we learned? Well, first, there is a growing interest over the years in utilizing mobile and wearable technologies for inciting health behavior change, particularly within medical informatics and computer science. Second, three out of four interventions have a sample size fewer than 100 subjects, and nine out of 10, uh, 10 have a duration shorter than one month, raising questions regarding the generalizability of the findings of such studies. Third, the focus in these interventions is shifted to adult populations, yet other age groups, such as the elderly or adolescents, who are most affected by physical inactivity, demonstrate hidden potential for the future. And finally, almost half Ubicom interventions did not base their design on any pre-existing theoretical framework for behavior change, meaning there is no social theory behind the technology that's supposed to help you change your behavior. Part of our research question was to uncover the factors that positively affect behavior change. Specifically, we recognized the need for systematization, emphasizing the importance of articulating our findings to facilitate fellow researchers uh, in the domain. Based on the reported results of the 129 papers that uh, we included in the review, as mentioned earlier, we ranked 29 design strategies for persuasive system design according to their effectiveness in promoting physical activity. Interesting fact, not all design strategies are equally effective across demographics. And I invite you to explore the online tool through the QR code that we built specifically for this purpose. So let me see. Uh, in the video, we can see, for example, that for the elderly population, design features based on similarity 
might work better. Whereas for children and adolescents, rewards have way more persuasive power. So there is no one size fits all solution, even for user interaction design. Finally, to be able to report on effectiveness, you need a way to quantify it. That's why we collected all reported metrics from 129 included studies, more than 100 metrics in total, and we grouped them under four dimensions. The perceived self dimension contains metrics related to self report such as demographics or emotional states. The physical self dimension contains objectively measured ubiquitous data, such as steps. The behavioral self dimension contains metrics related to logged user interaction, such as wear days or dual time. And finally, the environmental self, which contains external factors that affect user behavior, such as geolocation or weather conditions. Now, based on these 129 interventions of our literature review, we established that many do not utilize a theoretical framework in their design. The question is, how can you do so to design more effective interventions through inc incorporating theory? With the following work, we wanted to showcase how can behavioral theories be integrated into Ubicom Technologies development. How did we do it? Well, first, we selected the previously unexplored behavior change theory in the Ubicom domain, specifically the laser constraints negotiation model. This model supports that users face constraints in their effort, let's say, to exercise, such as lack of time or motivation and claims that users utilize uh, mechanisms, the so-called negotiation strategies, to overcome these constraints. This model was developed before wearables were a thing, so how can these strategies be translated into wearable feature? Um, what we did was we converted these non-digital strategies into textual descriptions of digital Ubicom features, which we then converted into a novel storyboard format. Note that this is a cross-university, cross-department collaboration between the sports science and the computer science departments of two universities, involving three field studies and 245 users in total. Let me give you an example. In the original non-digital scale, there is an item saying, I see exercise as a stress relief mechanism when I feel tense. Now, this has nothing to do with technology per se. So following a well-defined methodology, we moved from this textual description of the non-digital negotiation strategy to a visual description of a digital negotiation feature. Specifically, we crafted 33 visuals like the one depicted below in collaboration with an artist using an inclusive storyboards format. Why did we pick storyboards? Because storyboards uh, make complex co concepts such as machine learning and emerging Ubicom technologies easier to understand for diverse audiences and that are thus more human-centered. To validate the resulting storyboard-based scale, we conducted three field studies, including laymen, recreational, and professional athletes, which first proved the reliability and construct validity of the storyboard scale meaning it does what it promises, namely it measures also what the original scale measures. And two, we found that not all negotiation features are equally effective across cohorts, while users of wearable devices find negotiation features more effective overall. Summing up, user interaction alignment is imperative given user diversity. We approach it through evidence-based and diversity-aware design, user engagement evaluation across multiple dimensions, and inclusive and well-defined methodology for translating theory into practice. How can you put all this knowledge into practice in your day-to-day -day research and work? First, embrace co-creation activities for de developing technological products together with your target audience. Incorporate theoretical frameworks for more effective interventions. And remember, one size does not fit all. Choose your design features carefully. What works for one demographic group does not necessarily work for another demographic group. And finally, continuously evaluate and refine your designs based on user data and feedback across multiple dimensions. Next, we move to data alignment. First, we need to understand the challenges related to Ubicom time series data. Most data sets, as we mentioned earlier, have a small sample size and short duration. At the same time, even for data sets of large sample size and long duration, we have a lot of missing values resulting from low user engagement. 
Ubicom data are also sourced from heterogeneous modalities, uh, let's say different sensors or different devices and manufacturers, making integration extremely cumbersome. And finally, many open data sets are collected in restrict restricted lab conditions, meaning they do not necessarily represent authentic user behavior. Ultimately, our second question goes as follows. What are efficient processes for collecting, sharing, and integrating Ubicom data from mobile and wearable devices at scale to facilitate the alignment of Ubicom technologies with human needs, values, and expectations? Given the significant lack of open Ubicom data, as highlighted in the introduction, uh, we designed and conducted our own data collection study. The results of which uh, were published at Nature's Scientific Data Journal, an accomplishment I'm extremely proud of. In more detail, the study resulted in a new Ubicom dataset called LiveSnaps, which explore various aspects of human behavior in the wild. The dataset is collected in two batches over a period of four months and across four countries, Sweden, Italy, Greece, and Cyprus. It contains three distinct data modalities, the objectively measured Fitbit data, self-reported survey, and ecological momentary assessment data to extract users' feelings and context in the moment, meaning the users receive the notification on their phone asking them how they feel uh, in the moment. While the study lasted four months, the effort required exceeded one and a half year. Our methodology was well grounded, meaning that it can be easily replicated for alternative cohorts, for example, for non cleared samples, and it comprises three stages. Starting with the experimental setup, including technical requirements, specification, and study design, followed by ensuring GDPR and ethics compliance. Then study execution, of course, including user recruitment and support throughout the study. We consciously opted for a gender balanced sample, and of course, implementation and monitoring of the study itself. And ultimately the data analysis stage, including the data collection and processing. And finally, the data exploration and machine learning modeling, where we drafted hundreds of visualizations and built a lot of machine learning models for facilitating the uptake of the data set and future, future research with it. This was a comprehensive effort encompassing many challenges, uh, emerging both from the nature of the data themselves, but also the human factors involved. In detail, the LiveSnaps uh, dataset is a large scale, longitudinal and geographically distributed dataset complying with GDPR and is approved by the university's ethics committee. We use state-of-the-art anonymization techniques with respect to users' privacy. We use three complementary data modalities encompassing multiple data types within its modalities, many of which appear for the first time in Ubicom datasets. We collect data in the wild, uh, capturing users' offending behavior, and we make data publicly available at the highest possible granularity, resulting in 71 million data points. We balance between duration and participation, recruiting 71 users over four months, considerably greater, greater than most Ubicom datasets. And we open source our data, code, and models to encourage dataset uptake and reproducibility. Finally, I'm very happy to share that our LiveSnaps dataset has been recently used by Google and MIT researchers as a benchmark for testing state-of-the-art generative AI algorithms and sensor data, giving an idea of the possibilities of what somebody can do with the LiveSnaps dataset. We spent tons of hours and creativity on data pre-processing and exploration, which naturally I cannot all share here, but I want to highlight that while our user engagement did decline over time, that's why you see darker shades of blue and green on the right side of the heat map, which is on the left. User engagement remained relatively uh, high, achieving a mean engagement of 41 days, which corresponds to 73% of the study duration, which is higher than comparable studies. To complement our Lifestyle's contribution, we also released the Wear Merge platform and API for facilitating the integration and standardization of Ubicom data from different manufacturers, models, and sensors. In the platform, let's say a researcher, one of you, wants to merge an existing dataset they own, let's say from Apple Watch devices, with the LiveSnaps dataset, which let's say comes from uh, which comes from Fitbit devices. They can upload their data on our platform, which will then automatically perform basic data cleaning, data validation, namely recognizing the manufacturer's representation format, and data integration 
comprising of multiple substeps we'll discuss in the following slide. And finally, data transformation to the open M health standard for digital health data. This way, data from diverse manufacturers can be converted into a common format, uh, facilitating interoperability between the two. Regarding data integration and standardization, we follow a methodology which encompasses the following steps. First, schema, uh, schematic harmony evaluation. For example, we might examine which schemas include temperature-related information, such as the Fitbit and Apple Watch ones, and which not. Second, content-based record linkage. Uh, for instance, one schema might mention temperature as a field name, while another one might use the term temp. It is essential to group these fields together because they represent the same measurable quantity, namely temperature. And third, data compatibility handling. See here that we have two temperature fields, but in different measurement units. We need to harmonize them into the same unit. Finally, after data transformation to the OpenM Health standard, different data representations from diverse manufacturers, let's say from your proprietary data and LiveSnaps data, would look the same like this. Now, summing up, data alignment calls for data accessibility, which on one side requires data access, yes, but also data usability for people with diverse levels of technical literacy. We approach data alignment through GDPR and ethics compliant data collection, open access sharing of Ubicom data, and the facilitation of integrating and standardizing data from diverse manufacturers, models, and sensors. How can you put this knowledge into practice again? Well, if you work with a research institution, promote open research through publishing new Ubicom datasets for diverse user cohorts and use cases, of course, always with respect to users' privacy. If you're a business, take advantage of proprietary and open data sets like LiveSnaps to encourage data-driven decisions within your organization and incorporate intelligence into your business pipeline. Next, moving to algorithmic alignment. Of course, there are multiple challenges in building algorithms for Ubicom data. It would be impossible to tackle them all. Here, we focus first on the neglect for personalization in algorithmic development. For example, human activity recognition, maybe the most popular uh, algorithmic task in Ubicom, cannot just adopt a one-size-fits-all approach. I don't walk the same way or I don't have the same posture that my grandfather does. Hence, our accelerometer time series measurements might signify different things. Also, there are no established Ubicom benchmark data and models, whereas in computer vision, let's say, we have CIFAR-10 and many more data sets and models. Recommender systems, we have uh, MovieLens. And these benchmarks truly facilitate researchers in developing and comparing state-of-the-art models. But this is not the case in Ubicom. So our third question goes as follows. How can we harness Ubicom data and personalized learning to benchmark digital health and well-being applications and align them with what humans uh, need, value, and expect in the real world. As we've highlighted from the beginning, personalization is important for human-centered computing. But what does personalization really mean? Personalized machine learning adapts machine learning algorithms to align them with individual users' or groups' behaviors. Extending prior work on machine learning personalization by MIT Media Lab, we explore a continuum of personalization conceptualizations for the use case of stress detection. Specifically, using multitask learning, we develop the following models. First, a generic model, baseline single task learning model, which adopt a one size fits all approach. Namely, I have one model for all my users. Next, uh, we adopt a multitask learning model where each task is defined as an individual wearable user. What does this mean? An MTL model or multitask learning model is a network that, that learns multiple tasks at the same time. The initial layers of the neural network in, blue, in black and white are shared among users, whereas the later layers, uh, colored, are task or user specific and thus are more personalized to the individual user. Yet, this implementation, this implementation suffers from the cold start problem. Namely, if a new user comes, it's very difficult to integrate them into the current model. So we follow a multitask learning approach where each task is now defined as a group of users. In line with uh, the MIT Media Lab architecture, we group users based on their personality traits. 
However, to extract such information, we need users to complete certain surveys, which is not always realistic because users' time uh, is precious. So in our extension of this work, we opted for using the existing objectively measured sensor data to group users based on their behaviors, and we use these groups as tasks. So now we have um, users grouped based on their Fitbit data, let's say, and users with similar behavior get uh, the same outcomes from the machine learning model. We also tried fuzz grouping where each user would belong to more than one task. And these approaches, this and the previous one, do not suffer from the cold start problem and do not require any input from the user other than the already passively collected sensor data. To test the efficacy of these diverse conceptualizations of personalizations, uh, personalization, we need to challenge them under different contexts, live snaps being one of them. Thus, we carefully selected four benchmark data sets, live snaps included, balanced to cover uh, diverse contexts. For example, both in the wild and in the lab data, and data which contains uh, objectively measured stress labels or perceived stress by self-reports. Here you can also see the difference in terms of participants and duration between live snaps and other related datasets. In response to our research question about model personalization, our results indicate that personalized models consistently outperform traditional one-size-fits-all approaches in terms of F1 score in the specific case. Multi-attribute models in blue, uh, where we define groups of users based on uh, multiple objectively measured sensor data, perform better than single attribute models in pink, where we define groups based on personality only. Overall, machine learning algorithms perform better than deep learning ones, possibly because of the small size of Ubicom datasets, which is also the case in the real world many times. And finally, perhaps not surprisingly, stress detection algorithms operated much better in lab conditions compared to in the wild or in the real world. As we saw the challenges mentioned earlier and the respective research question, um, the Ubicom domain suffers from a lack of reproducible benchmarks. Truth is that the lack of benchmarks significantly delayed our implementation in the previous project as the majority of our time went to data pre-processing and modeling. Hence, we decided to publish our own five-step Ubicom benchmark for the pretext ta task of physical activity prediction. Uh, this means a model that predicts how much activity the user perform on the following day in order to set appropriate goals for them. We initially discussed the data set availability and the Ubicom data idiosyncrasies. We then follow with data pre-processing, uh, specifically targeted to Ubicom data. Next, we comprehensively benchmark both machine learning and deep learning approaches and evaluate them with a time series aware approach. Finally, we discuss applications for benchmark across disciplines. And in the next four slides, we are going to see this step by step. To develop the UbiWare benchmark, we utilize the MyHeartCounts dataset, published in 2019 by Stanford Medicine. Given the lack of benchmarks, we had to develop everything from scratch. MyHeartCounts is actually the largest open Ubicom dataset, dataset today, with extremely heterogeneous and noisy data. All the above give us an idea uh, of the Ubicom data self-tracking uh, idiosyncrasies, such as arbitrary sampling frequency, contrary to well-defined time series, non-consecutive records due to nowhere time or overlapping records due to multiple devices and fitness applications per user and multiple subjects, of course, each combining all the above challenges. In response to this idiosyncrasies, we then comprehensively benchmarked different data wrangling methods in terms of data cleaning, feature engineering, time series related transformations and machine learning preparation. Now, this might seem like a conventional machine learning preprocessing pipeline, but in reality, great effort is required to adapt these methods to time series data. What I would like to mention maybe here, for example, is that consecutive records cannot be assumed as users do not always wear their wearable device or carry their phone around. Duplicate removal should be performed on a user by user basis and not across the whole data set. Missing values imputation should only refer to active hours. You should not, let's say, impute steps in the middle of the night. 
and pre-sampling should be performed only after verifying a common granularity for all inputs, which is not the case with mobile and wearable data. I want to also highlight that we also published a Python library, which is available via PIP, to automate such pre-processing act actions in the future, specifically targeted to self-tracking data. When it comes to modeling, uh, we have a time series forecasting task at hand, namely predicting the number of steps for the following day for its user, which we approach both with machine learning and deep learning algorithms. Here, I indicatively present the final deep learning architectures for the uh, multi-layer per per perceptron, LSTM, and CNN models, and the table presenting our hyperparameter tuning. While there are a lot of details here, I just want to showcase the overall effort that was put into optimizing these models for the task at hand, and all these models are actually publicly available on GitHub. I also want to highlight um, that we utilize this benchmark in a work we'll discuss in the holistic alignment section next, but keep it in mind for now. In terms of evaluation, we compare uh, the, both the mean and the median absolute error in terms of steps for each model. Ultimately, the LSTL, LSTM model for this task achieved a mean absolute error of around 1,000 steps, which is 65% uh, lower than previous state-of-the-art models trained on smaller data sets. To encourage reproducibility, we open our benchmark and data, um, our benchmark data and models on GitHub. And we thoroughly document our code and utilize containerization for cross-platform compatibility. Truth is that the My Heart Counts dataset is weird, meaning Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. It's an acronym used a lot in uh, fairness research. Most users are older age males. The question is, how does this affect our benchmark in terms of bias? And we'll refer to this issue again in the holistic alignment section next. Now, algorithmic alignment calls for recognizing user diversity. We approach it through personalization of cubicle models and the development of reproducible public benchmarks for mobile and wearable use cases. How can we put this knowledge into practice in our day-to-day -day research or work? Well, first, in multiple domains that are open benchmark data and models which are freely available to use. Using such benchmarks can actually save both time and money in incorporating intelligence into your business or research pipelines without the need to train and fine tune proprietary ML models. Take care because these benchmarks might not be an exact fit to your use case or user cohort, and most likely there will need some fine tuning to perform well. If you are already working with your own machine learning models, do consider personalization, not necessarily at an individual, but possibly at a group level, to see if you can achieve a better outcome for diverse cohorts of users. Finally, we have seen contributions related to user interaction, data, and algorithmic alignment independently, and now we adopt a more comprehensive viewpoint, touching upon the holistic alignment problem. The development of Ubicom systems has primarily focused on accuracy, both in the academic and industrial settings, leading to emergent issues in terms of fairness. If a model performs well, let's say in terms of AUG score overall, this does not necessarily mean that it performs well for all user cohorts. Think of the oximeter use case we discussed in the introduction. So our research question goes as follows. Um, how can we systematically proceed beyond the current accuracy-centric solutions? Focusing uh, on a Ubicom that is fairer and aligns with human needs and values and expectations. I want to highlight here that uh, fairness considerations within Ubicom have been widely understudied till now, as we will also showcase with our findings. But why is fairness important in machine learning? Uh, first and foremost, out of respect for human rights. Here you see Article 21 on non-discrimination from the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. Second, to promote a positive societal impact as a business or institution. Here we have, let's say, the responsible AI pillars, Fairness being one of them, of the Nokia Bell Labs, a pioneering company in mobile and wearable computing. And third, for complying with current and future regulatory initiatives for responsible AI, which always encompass fairness dimensions. Here we have EU's AI Act pyramid showcasing the four levels of risk in AI systems. 
Well, you can say that fairness has been widely studied within machine lear the machine learning community. So what's new and why should we study fairness specifically in Ubicom? Truth is, biases can remain hidden in Ubicom data. For example, you can distinguish a person's skin tone from an image, but can you do so from sensor measurements? Ubicom data are also complex in nature, much more than most benchmark tabular datasets used in machine learning fairness research. Also, the machine learning fairness community normally works with ranking and binary classification problems, whereas in Ubicom, we work mostly with regression and multi-class classification problems, meaning that the algorithms developed for my bias mitigation by the machine learning fairness community might not be a direct fit to the Ubicom community and tasks. And finally, while machine learning fairness benchmarks are static, Ubicom datasets can contain distribution shifts, which should be considered in fairness analysis. To provide an answer to our fourth research question, as a first step, we wanted to understand what's the machine learning fairness awareness within the Ubicom community. To this end, based on the past five years of publications in ACM Inwood's journal, uh, perhaps the most pro pro prominent publishing venue for Ubicom research, we explored the state of fairness in the community, the types of biases that can emerge in Ubicom data, how does the community seek fairness, perhaps in a non-traditional way, which are the consequences of unfair Ubicom models, and what does Ub and whether Ubicom works with weird users, where I remind weird is Western, educated, industrialized, et cetera, et cetera. Following again uh, the same protocol, we identify more than 600 article, articles in ACM Digital Library. We assess 523 full texts for eligibility, and we include 49 papers in our review. Based on our survey, we actually found multiple hidden biases in Ubicom data, such as biases in pulse oximeter, uh, such as racial biases in pulse oximeter and optical heart rate sensors sex biases in acoustic-based breathing monitoring, and age biases in gait assessment with accelerometers, among others. I urge you to read our preprint paper for a full list of possible biases that we have identified in the included papers. Also, out of all papers published in Inwood in the past five years, only 5% reported fairness assessment, and even less, a mere 1% reported bias mitigation methods, regardless of whether they encountered bias or not. Ubicom samples are indeed weird, even though they are usually gender balanced. They are otherwise predominantly young, white, Western, highly educated and employed populations. And finally, we did not encounter any fairness metrics in the studied paper. Uh, papers. Rather, fairness was actually fairness comparisons were actually based on performance metrics. To encourage the adoption of fairness practices within the Ubicom community, we provide a large number of recommendations in this paper for fairness by design development and for aligning Ubicom technologies with social concerns. Our recommendations are categorized under the four different stages of machine learning development, namely data collection and annotation, data exploration and manipulation, model development and evaluation, and model deployment and use. For the interest of time, I'm going to indicatively describe just one example per category, but we have way more recommendation in the original work. For example, during data collection, developers should research possible biases tied to the sensors or technologies they use, and then recruit adequate sample sizes for the affected groups. During data manipulations, uh, manipulations, they should consider that pre-processing actions might affect different demographics to a different extent. For example, this is particularly in this interesting with time series data and the windowing operation applied to them, where demographic discrepancies in the original samples might be multiplied in the pre-processed windowed samples. In model development and evaluation, developers, similarly to accuracy, should evaluate for fairness using diverse metrics relevant to the use case. Um, here, domain and context awareness is extremely important, and we need to assess the impact on intersectional cohorts. And finally, in deployment, especially for time series data with shifting distributions, Fairness evaluations should be ongoing and models should be reassessed in deployment given the collected data from the real world. Going from theory to practice and in response to our fourth question, 
Uh, in our next project, we wanted to showcase how a developer could actually integrate our recommendations in a Ubicomp pipeline. That's why we adopted the widely accepted framework for understanding sources of harm in the machine learning life cycle by Suris and Gutag, and we applied it to the Ubiware benchmark that we discussed before. The framework splits the life cycle of machine learning into two streams, each containing distinct sources of harm or bias. First, the data generation stream, which may be harmed by historical representation and measurement biases. Then the model building and implementation stream, which may be harmed by learning, aggregation, evaluation, and deployment biases. Let me give you a brief overview of our results for the data generation stream. In terms of historical biases, Ubicom data can be affected by inequalities in physical activity worldwide. The digital divide, not everyone is comfortable with or can own a smartwatch, but also disparities in sample recruitment due to the bring your own device approach adopted in many research studies. Uh, in the My Heart Counts data set that we use, uh, they follow the same approach as well. Let me give you an example. According, according to the World Health Organization, women, older adults, and people with disabilities and chronic diseases, among others, have less access to accessible, affordable, and appropriate spaces to be physically active, thus performing less physical activity worldwide, which was indeed captured also in our Ubicom dataset. In terms of representation biases, Ubicom data are not immune. Specifically, the My Heart Counts data that we studied are not representative of the actual US population at the time of the study. For example, we only have 0.2 women for every one man in the dataset, whereas the real work ratio would be closer to one to one. This means that the dataset do not necessarily represent uh, women's behavior equitably. And then in terms of measurement bias, we noticed statistically significant differences between the devices used by different demographics. For example, females tended to own older and cheaper phones in the My Heart Counts dataset with fewer capabilities and accuracy, possibly affecting the model accuracy in downstream tasks in our benchmark. In terms of aggregation and learning biases, namely biases that are caused by one size fits all modeling uh, approaches or by learning choices, we found that uh, aware models, namely models that include protected attributes in their feature set, propagate or even amplify biases existing in the data. However, unaware models, namely models that do not include protected attributes demographics in their feature set, are also not foolproof against data bias in line with prior literature. The most interesting for us was that uh, personalized models following an architecture suggested by MIT Media Lab uh, can actually amplify data biases across all protected attributes. So it's really important when developing personalized models to actually evaluate both for performance and fairness. In terms of evaluation biases, we also encountered some interesting findings. Specifically, we used two test sets for evaluation. One was random and the other one was edited to contain no data bias in terms of disparate impact ratio, which is a popular fairness metric. We noticed that this artificially perfect test set was consistently hiding model biases for the same models that we did identify biases before. In other words, it's not so difficult to hide model imperfections if you choose a misrepresentative benchmark, which raises raise question about reporting biases in the future. Finally, we should always remember that in deployment, our models operate in a complex socio-technical environment. Human biases are also at play and thus we need to be, uh, the way we build models is not necessarily the way they are used. We should continuously assess deployed models, uh, also using a variety of evaluation dimensions that are context specific. Delving deeper into the model building and implementation stream and specifically learning and aggregation biases, we want you to go beyond the UBWare benchmark to incorporate more recent learning paradigms in our analysis in response again to our fourth research question. Self-supervised -super self learning is widely used recently within the Ubicom community because it can learn useful representations from large amounts of unlabeled data, which is the case uh, with many Ubicom datasets. These representations, of course, can later be fine-tuned to downstream tasks, utilizing smaller amounts of labeled data. 
Specifically, we utilize an adaptation of an algorithm called SimClear, which utilizes contrastive learning to extract data representations. I will not go into detail on how this algorithm works, but I'm happy to explain it later if you're interested. Now, SSL, self-supervised learning, has been vetted for performance even within Ubicom, showing comparable accuracy to supervised alternatives. But what about biases? Our hypothesis is that SSL models might exhibit less bias given that their representations are only partially affected by labels, which in turn might actually contain biases steered by the downstream tasks. To test our hypothesis, we propose a comprehensive five-stage fairness assessment framework to examine how SSL fine-tuning affects fairness both in terms of outcomes and representation. Let me explain briefly. We first choose an appropriate, uh, appropriate Cubicom datasets given a series of requirements. Then we train the SimClear base encoder. Essentially, we learn representations for our data, which we'll then utilize on downstream tasks through appropriate weight transfer. Third, we set up a fine tuning strategy where we freeze certain layers of the base encoder and fine tune others. Essentially, we experiment with different levels of weight transfer. This is a key step in our methodology to find the optimal level of fine tuning, balancing between performance and biases. Fine tuning has been actually found to affect accuracy in SSL in prior work, so it is actually imperative that we assess its effect on bias as well. Fourth, we examine the learned representations, what the model learned, but conditioned on protected attributes. Are the male users' representations the same as the female users? Do these differences cause bias discrepancies? And finally, we perform a context-specific evaluation, both in terms of accuracy and bias. Let's explore this step by step. First, we carefully choose three benchmark datasets that check all our requirements. Specifically, we need datasets with access to protected attributes of large enough size to suffice for SSL pre-training, multiple modalities to better mirror the real-world use cases, and preferably being accompanied by an open benchmark, uh, either a model or data set, to accelerate development and to facilitate state-of-the-art comparisons. Our selected benchmark datasets cover three diverse tasks in Ubicom, uh, namely mortality prediction, sleep weight classification, and depression detection. We built more than 100 models after hyperparameter tuning and various levels of fine-tuning to find the best implementations for our comparisons. Second, uh, I've told you we tried different fine tuning strategies, but what works best in terms of accuracy? To understand our fine, to understand our fine tuning st strategies, consider the following. We denote frozen layers of our uh, base encoder with a snowflake and trainable layers or fine tuned layers with a plane. So in the highlighted model, we freeze only the middle layer and fine tune or essentially retrain the first and last layers with the downstream task data. We found that the level of fine tuning in SSL greatly affects the observed performance. Across datasets, a medium level of fine tuning, where we freeze only a single layer, the middle one, achieves best performance comparable with a supervised model and on the same dataset. I want to know to note that according to the literature, the middle layer of the base encoder actually holds the most informative weights for the representations. So this result theoretically makes sense too. Now we move forward comparing the supervised baseline model with the best performing SSL model in terms of representations or what they learn from the data. We notice two things. First, representation similarity is lower for the worst than the best performing protected groups. In other, words, in other words, for those demographics that the model performs the worst, the, the models perform badly for different reasons, as their representations are significantly different, which is not the case for the best performing demographics. Secondly, the higher the accuracy gap between the best and worst performing protected attributes, the larger the representation gap. The question is, do these representation differences lead to bias differences as well? The answer is yes. When comparing all models in terms of aggregation bias, not accuracy this time, we observe a U-shape pattern in our box plots across datasets, suggesting an optimal level of fine tuning, both for performance and fairness. 
actually the supervised model, which is the uh, left model in the left model in dark purple, uh, has more bias compared to the best performing SSL model, which is the middle one in dark green. So these representation differences that we saw before do make a difference in terms of bias too. Closing up, we approach holistic alignment through fairness aware mobile and wearable computing. Through this, we need more awareness within Ubicom regarding machine learning fairness, especially because according to our experiment, Ubicom systems can suffer from diverse biases across the machine learning life cycle. How can you put all this knowledge into practice in your day-to-day -day research or work? This is actually my favorite part because if I want you to take just one thing out of this presentation, is to go back to your research project or product and ask yourself, does my technology work equally well for all my users? Now, I've given you some ideas on how you can achieve that, but I'm open for a more targeted discussion during the Q&A, specifically for, for the applications that might be of interest to you. We are almost done, so please bear with me for a little while extra. Summing up, and on a more abstract level, to align Ubicom technologies with human values, needs, and expectations, we encourage the Ubicom community to adopt the following human-centered machine learning practices. First, ensure machine learning is the right solution to the problem. Do we really need workplace monitoring via wearables, regardless of context? Second, we need to acknowledge that machine learning problem statements take positions. Can sensors identify all types of human activities and emotional states? We are complex beings after all. Third, we need to legitimize learning and collaborating with other communities. Let's say the human computer interaction community or the fairness, accountability and transparency community or even communities outside the computer science domain. And finally, we should design systems expecting them to fail. Only then we can ensure that we are alert about the potential harms that our systems can cause to our users. Uh, all presented works are either published or under review in international journals and conferences. And I pre present them here just for your convenience and ease of access. And thank you very much for your attention and your time. And I would be happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, uh, Sophia, for a very interesting talk with a lot of content. So now we stop recording and take questions.